Well, it's a great pleasure to, to be here. Thank you very much, Peter, for, for inviting me. I'm particularly interested to come because I think the research, which I'm going to talk about today, is a piece of research I'm going to talk about, chimes very well with the, with the theme of the conference around streets as drivers of urban prosperity. So I'm particularly going to talk about a piece of research which I did a few years ago in London, but has only just recently been published, which looked at mixed streets, what in London we call high streets, elsewhere might be called main streets. And these type of streets very much capture the diversity, the dynamism, the variety, and the contrast of cities, uh, not least uh, London. They're often the responsibility of many, but equally often they're ignored uh, by many of those who essentially have responsibility for them. Now in the UK, perhaps we have an idyllic view of the high street from 100 years ago, a place of, of community and, and interaction and, and civility. Um, more often today, our high streets are a little bit like this. Uh, this is Putney High Street, as was the previous slide, 100 years between the, two, uh, between the two images. Today, it's the most polluted street uh, in London. So, in London, as in many cities around the world, we have a sort of tale of two cities. While some of our mixed streets thrive uh, and go from strength to strength, others appear to suffer. Uh, the images on your right-hand side uh, of my local high street, uh, Trafalgar Road in Greenwich, which is typified by um, betting shops and fast food establishments and shops that have shut down and so forth. You know, real problems. And in fact, we have contrasting narratives of these mixed streets uh, in London and I'm sure elsewhere. So some people talk about them as being congested and, and, and polluted and deprived, dilapidated, inefficient, dirty, ugly, old-fashioned, antisocial. But others talk about them as places that are vibrant and inclusive, are loved by their local people, full of character, diverse, familiar, social, communal, and so forth. And very often you see these contrasting narratives when we're thinking about what we're going to do about the neighborhoods and places through which these uh, important streets pass. So what is the real story? Well, this is what a research project which I did a few years ago tried to investigate, as I say, uh, by looking in depth at one city, and that city was London. The aim of the work was to develop a better understanding and insight into the functioning of high streets, or mixed streets, um, and thereby identify the role of those streets in supporting London's sustainable growth uh, and development. And we did a, a range of research approaches, uh, including a lot of morphological analysis and a lot of GIS mapping uh, and some in-depth case studies of six streets uh, scattered, six mixed streets scattered uh, across London. Now, what and where are London's high streets? Well, if you looked at the London plan produced by the Mayor of London, then you'd think they were uh, blobs on the map scattered across the city. Uh, whereas, of course, as we all know, streets are not blobs. Uh, streets are actually lines. Um, and, uh, in fact, there are 113 streets named either High Street or High Road in London, if you look at the A to Z map. Um, but that's not the whole story either. Because if you start to map retail and lengths of retail, then what you find is that across London there are 702 lengths of continuous retail that's at least 250 metres long. And we took that as the definition of a, a, a high street uh, for the purposes of our research. 500 kilometres of these uh, mixed streets uh, in, in, in the, that uh, one city. What they are are continuous and connective, largely unremarkable, pretty ordinary streets um, that are mixed uh, and which bind the city together, cut across the city and bind it together. They have a long history, many of them, some of them dating back to the evolution of the city in Roman times and the Roman roads stretching out of Londinium 
And those roads are still there today, and you can see them as the essence the, the, uh, and, and, and the alignment of those roads still in many of our mixed streets in the city, and others, of course, have developed since then. They're sites of rapid and continual change in the uses and activities uh, and the purposes to which we uh, put those places. And they're truly mixed. We often think of these places as just retail, and think it's just the retail that's important, but it's not, they're truly mixed. In our research, in our six case studies, if we stripped out residential functions, then we found a two to two to one retail office industrial split in the uses. When we took a 200 meter uh, continuous line uh, along each side of these streets. So they really are mixed places. They're mixed also in their morphologies, but what unites them all is that you tend to get a very thin crust of active uses along the streets that can often go on for many miles in a city like London. And behind that is an invisible hinterland, which we don't appreciate when we're walking along the streets, but is a critical part of those streets the block depth that runs along this crust of active use, and which is part of the mixed street. And it's in there that all this sort of industrial and commercial uses happen, as well as along the actual active street itself. In London, these type of streets amount to just 3.5% of London's road network. But, interestingly, they're where one and a half million Londoners work. Now, our research looked at the area outside the central activity zone. If we compare the mixed streets uh, in the sort of outer and inner London with the uh, amount of employment uh, in the central activity zone, then there are more, more people work along those streets than in the central activity zone, in the city of London and Westminster and so forth. And there are twice as many companies, twice as many businesses located on those local mixed streets uh, than in the central activity zone. And none of this is really understood or appreciated how important these types of streets are for the functioning and the prosperity of our cities. They're where small businesses often predominate. Sites of innovation and competitiveness and, and local sustainability because they employ local people and, and the money that they generate is churned back into the local communities. They're places of character and familiarity and exchange, social and economic and political exchange. In our research that we found that only a third of trips to these streets was for shopping. People went there for, for leisure, for work, to visit friends, to catch the bus, and for a whole variety of other reasons, and sometimes for shopping. They're at the heart of a sustainable movement framework because it's along these streets that are, much of our public transport uh, goes. And we found that only a fifth of trips in London were by car to these streets, although many are dominated by cars moving up and down those streets which has unfortunate side effects, because these are also streets which are often very polluted. In London, for example, almost all of London's high streets have concentrations of nit nitrogen dioxide, which are well above the safe limits set down by the EU. And particulates, which are particularly important for people with respiratory problems, are also often well above the safe limits. And this is a characteristic of many of these mixed streets. Interestingly, we also found that there are places of huge development potential, often unrealized by policymakers, who tend to focus on the very large brownfield sites, often outside of existing population centers, because those are the sites that are easy to develop. But what we found is many, uh, actually half of London's brownfield sites, are within a two-minute walk, or actually on or within a two-minute walk of these mixed streets. But often they're the smaller, more difficult to develop sites. And of course these streets 
some of which have been, in London's case, there for 2,000 years, represent a substantial sunk investment that's already there, already there for us to use. The infrastructure and the services that they host are there and we can use uh, into the future. And of course, in the case of London, almost all Londoners have a stake. Two-thirds of Londoners, Londoners live within a five-minute walk of a local uh, mixed street. That's five million people. So, in some respects, London's high streets, London's mixed streets, are clearly suffering. Not least because of the move of much retail online and away from uh, local parades of shops, which, on the face of it, is causing uh, many of our shops to shut down. But they're also hugely resilient spaces, as is proven by the 2,000 years that many of them have been in existence, and, in existence, and they continue, uh, many of them, to thrive and develop. So what are we doing about their future in London? Well, not a lot. Except we are writing lots of reports. Uh, this is a characteristic of, uh, of the UK. We like to write a lot of reports about problems. Um, occasionally we do something about them, but not too often. Uh, in national planning policy, uh, the drive is to deregulate at the moment, and that is having an impact because we have a planning system which regulates whether you can change uses, um, and there's been an argument that we're too rigid in the, how uses need to be able to be more flexible and change, particularly on mixed streets. There's a, there's a particular danger in London that if we free up and allow all of the uses to change uh, 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 too easily, then almost all of our high streets will become simply residential streets because there's such a demand for a residential accommodation in London and the prices are so high. So there's some danger with this, this, this policy. At the London-wide scale, many of these streets are completely ignored. They're, out, they're not even recognised in the London plan. 77% of the streets I mentioned are outside of any designated town centres. And in local policy, in the 33 local boroughs, again, there's almost an absence of policy, really, to, to, to think about these as places. And perhaps that's something to do with their complexity, that these are complex pieces of physical fabric at the same time, they're places of exchange, social, cultural, economic exchange, and that's really difficult to understand and get a hold of. They're places of movement. They're part of this uh, public movement uh, corridor for pedestrians and cyclists, as well as public transport and private. And they're complex pieces of real estate with complex patterns of ownership that have, cha that, that have developed over, for, over many years. So often they're complexity means they're very difficult for us to understand and grapple with. In London, there are two silver linings in terms of things that we, we're doing at the moment. Uh, the first is the organisation that's responsible for many of our roads in London is an organisation called TFL, which stands for Transport for London. Uh, and finally, after many, many years, they finally understood that these streets are not just about movement, they actually have a place function as well. And they've developed a series of strategies to um, classify streets across the city according to both their movement function and their place function. And it's a combination of those two things that in the future will dictate uh, how roads are designed uh, and delivered uh, as part of the street framework. So that's one important thing that's happened. Another important thing is the mayor, the current mayor, has been investing some money uh, in high streets uh, as part of three funds. One is uh, 70 million, one is 41 million, and one is 50 million pounds, which sounds like an awful lot of money going into high streets. Um, uh, it sounds like a lot, as I said, but in fact is really just a drop in the ocean when you think that one new shopping centre, the Westfield Shopping Centre in London, costs 1.6 billion pounds, and that's just one of four, uh, three shopping centres of that size, and other smaller ones like one new change in London, which just show the, uh, the, the, the sort of unbalanced investment that's going into different types of, of facility. So, to some conclusions. London's high streets, as I said, account for just 3.6% of its road network, but they represent some of the most important and potentially sustainable spaces of the city. They have huge strategic potential, 
and are also at the same time of great local significance for Londoners and their everyday well-being. Now, I would argue we need to prioritise investment in London's high street network uh, in order to deliver growth and regeneration benefits that we just can't deliver in those more difficult-to-reach sites away from our existing centres of community. Unfortunately, as I've argued, these streets tend to languish in the too-difficult-to-handle category because we simply don't understand them or don't take the time to develop solutions which might be appropriate for these complex places. And London streets are not alone. These mixed streets are a typology that we see around the world. And I would argue that many of the problems that we have in London and, 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 and the difficulties in grappling with those problems are experienced around the world, in cities around the world, in these mixed streets, which are so important to the future of our cities. So we need a more sophisticated view. And the risk of quoting myself, which I will do here, um, the street, we need a view of the street as embedded within a hinterland that feeds and shapes the space, whilst the resulting corridor is continuous and connected, um, with depth that spreads beyond the thin retail crust, a unifying seam instead of a dividing edge, and a major planning entity in its own right. That's how we need to see these streets, as continuous and connective with hinterland. So not just this, it's not just about that, it's also about that as well, the depth, what's behind the facades that very often we don't think about. It's not just about that, uh, or even that, it's also about that, because these streets go on and on and on, cutting through our cities, often for many miles. And we need to think about them in their entirety. We need that holistic view that thinks about them as physical fabric, but also places of movement, of real estate and exchange. And we need processes of management that will look at these as in a holistic way. And often we don't have that. As I say, we need to prioritise investment, prioritise investment in mixed streets, in public realm improvements. We've started to do that in London. Kensington High Street is a good example of that. We need to refocus investment of co in community uses uh, and civic uses back onto the high streets after many years of taking functions like swimming pools and cinemas and things away from our mixed streets. We need to think about how we can attenuate some of the pollution problems, which are critical uh, to encouraging people to live on those high streets. We might think about designating linear opportunity areas rather than just designating sort of big out-of-town sites, if you like, as places of opportunity. And we need to build the important coalitions of interest because these are incredibly complex places, which is part of the problem that they're owned and managed by so many different individuals and organisations and getting them even together to talk about their local streets is a real challenge. So I would argue it's time that we took these streets uh, uh, seriously. This is a global challenge. It's not just about London, but I've used London as the example to illustrate the fact that we need to spend time to better understand our streets. And I would argue that if we do understand them, that we will see that they are critical drivers of prosperity. If you want to find out more, then the paper on which uh, this talk is based is at that link there. Thank you very much. Thank you.